Hello everyone, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I'm at the RAF Museum in London. Now this is a great place to have a look at some of those classic aircraft from World War I, World War II and of course the Cold War period. So you know what, why don't we go inside and have a look at one of those exhibits. Today we are looking at a Heinkel HE-162. This aircraft is known under a few additional names like Salamander, Spatz and of course Volksjäger, People's Fighter. The aircraft was designed mid to late 1944 and put into production in early 1945. Although meant to be produced in mass quantity and quickly, very few aircraft made it to the front lines and even fewer flew in combat in April 1945, just before the collapse of the Third Reich. At the end of the walkaround I will talk more about the object's history, but for now let's get started with the walkaround. First, the basics. The HE-162 is a single-seat, single-engine, jet-powered monoplane that was designed with the primary aim to be cheap and easy to manufacture. The aircraft is 9 meters in length, 2.6 meters in height, and spans 7.2 meters. It weighs around 1,650 kilograms empty and 2,800 kilograms fully loaded. With these dimensions, it is certainly one of the smaller fighter planes to come out of World War II. As you watch this video, take note of the simple and rudimentary construction of the plane, which is a product of both Heinkel's aim to make this aircraft easy to produce, and the indiscriminate use of slave labor throughout the construction. Up front we are greeted with a long pitot tube. The placement of this tube in the nose was on purpose, while well, you see the same in later fighter jets as this allowed a speed measurement far away from the plane's body and thus an undisturbed airflow. The main reason was not technical, but to centralize all systems in as close a space as possible to avoid the need of extra wiring or unnecessary construction steps. It is empty except for ballast, the ground power socket and the space to house the upper part of the nose wheel. The nose wheel folds in half about at the point where it leaves the fuselage and swings rearward into the housing. And the wheel is stored between the pilot's legs and the rudder pedals. The cover closes while being simply pulled inwards. The nose wheel itself comes from a Junkers Ju-88 bomber, where it was used as a tail wheel. This is yet another example of how Heinkel developed this plane as fast as possible and how it used components already in use. Above the nose there is a small tab. This is the landing gear position indicator, telling the pilot whether the nose wheel is down and locked. He also has a window in the gear well, which gives him another visual clue. The large forward windscreen gave good forward visibility. Just behind the instrument board, the windscreen connects with the canopy. The canopy itself hinges upwards at the base, where it meets the fuselage. It does have to be closed when the engine is running, as it would otherwise disturb the airflow or, worse, brake and be sucked towards the turbine inlet. This configuration also led to the installation of an ejector seat, one of the first of its kind. This allows the pilot, in theory, to leave the aircraft in times of brown alert without interference from the turbine. Below the cockpit we see a small hole. This was to fire out signal flares with a small pistol. Then the weaponry. The aircraft is armed with two MG151-20s a 20mm cannon. This armament is surprisingly light for a late war German aircraft. However, it was the only feasible weapon choice. The barrel itself would run alongside the pilot on either side. The gun itself was mounted behind him, with the ammo supply mounted straight above. It supplied each gun with 120 rounds, and this allows for about 10 seconds of continuous fire. A bulkhead between this ammo supply and the pilot is sometimes referred to as armored, but it is hard to find any solid information on this. Above this and behind the canopy, the main battery for electrical power and behind it the radio set for the Funkgerät FUG25A IFF system. 
Below the engine, the fuel tank holding 650 liters. Alternative fuel arrangements could see a smaller two-tank arrangement or the use of wing tanks. This fuel tank supplies the BMW 003 E1 engine. This engine is an axial flow turbojet with a seven-stage axial compression and a static thrust of about 1,700 pounds. The engine is nigh identical to the BMW 003 A1. However, the wiring, mounting and fuel lines on the A1 were developed in such a fashion as to allow the engine to be mounted below a wing, not above a fuselage. As such, changes had to be made which resulted in the E1. Looking at the intake, you find what looks like a shock cone. This houses a two-stroke Riedel AK-11 starter motor with a metal ring allowing you to grasp and start the engine, just like you might do with a lawnmower or a boat. You can also see two of the three additional air scoops. Similar air scoops can be found near the exhaust and these permit additional cooling. The starter engine fuel tank and the jet engine's oil tank are set above the inlet. The loop antenna above the engine is for the aircraft's Funkgerät 25A radio and radio direction finding system. If you look at the installation of the engine, you will notice how simple it is. The covers can be quickly opened up with quick release latches on top and completely dismantled with latches on the bottom and these hinge pins running along the side. The same can be said about all of the top fuselage covers. Moving to the wing, the wooden wings extend out of the upper part of the fuselage. This is known as a shoulder wing configuration. As a dihedral wing, it extends upwards. At the wing root, we have a little airflow fence. And a drooped wing tip was added to counter stability problems. This one is made out of duralumin. On the trailing edge, the wooden flaps are right beside the wooden ailerons. The flaps are rather simple, they are known as plane flaps and are hydraulically operated. Where the trailing edge meets the fuselage, you can see this downward curved wing root. This was a change from the initial straight design and implemented with the fourth prototype. Looking at the exhaust, we find an extended fence installed to protect the rear part of the fuselage. The exhaust itself has three variable settings, but only two are indicated. A for starting and idle resulting in a greater nozzle exit area, and S for takeoff and climb, resulting in a smaller exit area. A third intermediate setting is in between. The German to the right is not original, something every German native speaker will have realized by now. While the plane was nicely restored to a static exhibit, there are various restoration and period related changes from the original, and the German writing features some spelling mistakes. I will say more on this at the end of the video. Back to the Heinko 162. Below the wing, the IFF antenna. As we look at the rear part of the fuselage, you have heat resistant plates up top. The tail is mounted to the fuselage as one unit, and a jack point is on the underside. A small fairing to protect the tail from tail strikes is just aft of one of these mounting points, connecting tail with fuselage. The horizontal stabilizers feature, of course, the elevator, while the vertical fins have a split rudder. The access panels either cover the mounting points or allow access to the control links. The metal tabs you see are the preset trim tabs you set on the ground. The plane features no trim tabs that the pilot can manually adjust mid-flight, because it is 1945 and ain't nobody got time for that. Except that that's not entirely true. Because instead of trim tabs, the whole tail section can be moved by 3 degrees upwards and 2 degrees downwards. This transforms your tail into your pitch trim. Moving to the port side, very little to see here again. The Funkgerät FUG24 is mounted just behind the main gear. The gear itself is, no surprise, simple and recycled. This wheel type and parts of the struts saw previous service in Messerschmitt BF109s. It swings backwards at the main hinge inside the well. Inside the well, you will also find a small oil tank. The rudder control cables run straight alongside the gear. The locking mechanism for the gear covers are shown here. 
And again, to allow the covers to open up and close, very simple hinge pins were used. Outside on the port side, looking at the leading edge, a small vent hole. The covers you see can be hinged downwards and allow easy access to the MG151-20 on either side. On the left hand side of the pilot, three small oxygen bottles are mounted. So, let's now talk about the aircraft we have here. This aircraft was built in April 1945 at Heinkel Nord near Rostock. Its Werk Nummer is 120227. It was delivered to Jakeschwader 1 at Leck in Schleswig-Holstein, close to the border to Denmark. The Jakeschwader was considered operational at the end of April, but flew very few missions. This aircraft was initially sent to Zweite Gruppe, which collected replacement aircraft for Erste Gruppe. When British forces moved up to Leck airfield on the 7th of May, the day after Germany's unconditional surrender, they found some 50 largely unused Heinke 162s, which they of course took possession of. By midsummer 1945, this aircraft alongside 11 other Heinkel 162s were sent to RAE Farnborough, but only five of these were flown. The aircraft you see here was not one of those. By the end of 1946, it was seen in a scrapping area at Farnborough and was later on put on a brief public display in Blackpool. After this, it seems it to have toured some RAF sites until the late 1950s, when it appeared at RAF Colerne together with an ME-163. It again toured the country for the next decade, often forming part of Battle of Britain displays. I'm going to assume here that these events just ran under the heading Battle of Britain to attract a crowd and were in fact larger events where a late war jet would not be amiss. In 1947, restoration began and ran for two years. This is where the aircraft was largely restored to the point you see it today. And it is at this point I want to talk about the paint job and the odd repairs. Many museums nowadays have exhibits that were restored in the 1960s, 70s, 80s and 90s. Back then, these jobs were done with the best of intentions and with the information available back then. Since then, Sometimes more than 60 to 30 years have passed. During those years, museums have learned a lot about how to restore and conserve, meaning that mistakes made back then are unlikely to happen again, while at the same time, museums are very careful about what projects they take on and what aircraft they will work on next. I sometimes see people getting angry about visual mistakes and exhibits, and while I understand the passion and the desire to get things right, I will add that restorations and changes to exhibits in general take a lot of time, care, expertise, manpower, and money. If you are interested in the subject, I'd highly encourage you to talk to some of the volunteers or members of staff at your local museums for more insights because they will most likely have a lot of stories for you about the aircraft in their collection and about their restoration process. As for this aircraft, it moved to the RAF Museum in London in 1989 and has been there ever since. It is one of only a few Heinkel 162s remaining. So I hope that you enjoyed this look at the aircraft found at the museum. And if you did, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon or channel memberships. This allows me to travel to these museums to film and by sharing this video. I would also like to thank the RAF Museum for the great access they gave me on this machine and specifically Ashley, Steve and Chris over at the museum. Also consider checking out the RAF Museum's YouTube channel for more aviation goodness. As always, have a great day and see you in the sky.